I'm your lead instructor today. Thank you guys so much for coming out to the VCon class. It means a lot to me. Um, so let's get started. So obviously you guys know this is basically just how to stop life-threatening bleeding. Um, and it should be all right, not too bad. So I just want to let you guys know this is not something that I just kind of made up out of the blue. You know, this is something that I started with the Department of Homeland Security, and um, is essentially a cooperative effort through all of these committees. So essentially, the focus is to recognize bleeding, stop it, and um, be able to contact the proper authorities, whether it's 911 or an EMT or something like that. So I hope you guys aren't squeamish because some of these uh, videos and pictures might be a little bit graphic. So why do you need the training? This can happen literally anywhere, whether you're at work or say there's a school shooting here. What are you going to do in this kind of situation? Or say you're at home, you're making dinner, and you accidentally cut yourself, or you drop your knife. It could happen there, too. Whether you work in an office building, say someone's running with scissors, and they drop their scissors, and they start bleeding out. Your office um, mates and your boss is going to want to know that you have the skills and the capability to help someone if someone's in that situation. Examples where this kind of information would be helpful is something like the Boston bombings, where um, so three people lost more than one limb. Maybe some of that could have been prevented, and that number could have been even lower if some if we knew this information um, at the scene. Also, the Columbine High School shooting, there were 15 deaths, and um, most of those were by gunshots, and we'll get into gunshot wounds later and how to care for those. Uh, one thing to note is that the IEDs that this person brought, they were never used because he did enough damage with these gunshot wounds. So one thing that I just want to um, let you guys know about is the acronym MARCH. So I don't know if any of you guys are EMTs or have or are in the process of EMT training. You might have learned ABC, but I want to teach you about something else called March. So the first is massive hemorrhage. This is the first and foremost thing that you need to take care of if this is some kind of crisis that you're helping someone with, or even if it's yourself. First of all, you have to control the life that you do. And this is Essentially why this class is so important is because it's the first thing that you have to take care of. Second of all <coughs> is airway. So once you stop the bleeding, then you have to work on airway, and it keeps going on and on um, from most important to least important. But I just wanted to point out that um, controlling life-threatening bleeding is first and foremost. If you're bleeding out, you're not going to have any blood left in you, so the rest of this is pointless as well essentially if you can't control the massive damage. So the first thing to do is make sure you are safe. If, say, a um, school shooting does happen, you don't want to get in the way and you don't want to put yourself at danger. So first of all is to make sure that you are safe. You don't want to become a second victim. And then once you are sure that you are safe, you can go into caring for others. And the first would be A, alert, call 911, B, bleeding, and C, compress. And we'll go into these a little more in detail, but this is just kind of a general overview. So like I said, you don't want to become a second victim. And um, so say you do think it's okay to go help someone, and it turns out that in the scene is not safe and you don't feel okay, it's okay to step back, make sure you are safe, and then once the scene is safe, you can go back in and help because you definitely don't want to be that second victim and cause more casualties. You want to bring that number down, not up. So ABCs of bleeding. The first is alert. What you want to do is you want to call 
911 or get someone to call 911. So say we're in a big room like this and someone starts bleeding. You can say like, hey, you, you call 911. Hey, you, you do this. Hey, you, you do that. You can kind of delegate so you can get everyone helping and things will go a little bit quickly, quicker. Um, actually, you still have some, sorry. Um, so say you are by yourself, what you can do is you can call 911 and put 911 on speakerphone because if uh, one thing that I want to let you guys know is that say it is a major bleed, you can bleed out within three minutes. Three minutes is not much time. If you decide to call 911 first and then help them, you know you might be on the phone with 911 for a minute or two, and they've lost a significant amount of blood at that point. So just remember that you can put it. Put 911 on speakerphone while you go and help the person. All right, A, B, C, B is bleeding. So what you want to do after you call 911 is find where the person is bleeding from. So blood is liquid, blood will spread. So if someone's bleeding out of their arm, they might hold their arm in like this. Oh, ow, it hurts, and the blood will spread. It might end up looking like they're bleeding from their abdomen when really they're bleeding from their arm. And so it might look like you need to treat the abdomen, but really it's an arm. So just be aware of um, different things that something like this or um, something like that. So a couple of things to look for um, as far as life-threatening bleeding, what that constitutes is blood that's spurting out of the wound. So arterial bleeds, bleeding from your artery, that will spurt because it has the pressure from your heartbeat behind it, kind of um, making it spurt. Whereas veins, they're under less pressure, so they'll kind of ooze out. And blood that won't stop coming out of the wound, kind of same thing. If it's coming out of an artery, it has a little more pressure behind it, so it's going to keep going even if um, it's been bleeding for a while, whereas a venous bleed, although it will continue to bleed, won't be as strong, and it might stop maybe a little quicker, but something still to definitely take care of. Alright, so um, in this next video, um, I want you guys to look at essentially what I just talked about, how in a, uh, an arterial bleed, it spurts and it has a lot of force behind it, but as it continues to bleed, it has less and less force. Okay. See how it's spurting out and it has a high velocity, it's not nearly touching the skin, but soon it starts to decrease in pressure and it starts to touch the skin, but it still continues to spurt out like that. That's a sign of life-threatening bleeding. That's a pretty deep cut. And it goes for a while, but like we said, we only have three minutes until this essentially stops and we die. And something else to look for is blood soaking through a sheet or, clo or clothing. That's a sign of a lot of bleeding. You know, if you cut your finger, maybe a paper cut, you're not going to bleed much, but something else where the blood soaks through everything, that's a sign of loss of a lot of blood. Okay, so you can do a lot of good and you can do a lot of help if someone's bleeding from their extremities. And bleeding from your extremities, such as that foot there, that is something that you can really do to help prevent death. Whereas um, if it's on your torso, we'll get into that a little bit, that's a little harder to take care of. The best way to treat these kind of wounds is with a tourniquet or direct pressure. Again, we'll get into that in a little bit. <clears throat> Something to pay attention to is a junctional wound or in your torso. So say you get um, cut in like your shoulder area or your groin, groin area, that can be pretty hard to um, essentially put a tourniquet on, although you can pack it. Even though you do have big arteries and veins in these areas, um, you do want to be careful uh, because they are hard to treat with a tourniquet. So the best thing to do is use direct pressure and pack the wound in these areas. 
So one place you cannot use a tourniquet and you don't necessarily want to use direct pressure is in this chest and abdomen area. So you have big cavities, your thoracic and your abdominal cavities, and so you can pack technically, but uh, that's not something you're supposed to do because you'll, you'll, be, you'll be pushing into the cavity, say someone's bleeding from their chest, if you keep packing into that thoracic cavity, you're going to press down on the lungs and they'll start to not breathe, and then we're just creating more problems if you start doing it. You can apply direct pressure, say, so you're bleeding right here, you can put direct pressure on it, but you have to get them to the hospital as quick as you can. Okay, so C, compression. So like we said, Make sure you're safe. B of A, B, C is fine where the bleeding is. And something to keep in mind is look for any kind of trauma or first aid kit. They were in the chemistry building and you're with a couple of people when this happens. Can someone run over to the student health services real quick to pick up some supplies that can help you with stop this bleeding? But say there's not, what are we gonna do? So what you're going to do is you're going to use any kind of clean cloth or gauze and essentially just press down on it and apply direct pressure. So what you want to do when you're applying direct pressure is use, you should use your full, your full two hands and um, so say we'll use this mannequin as an example. You want to press down on it with two hands and put your full body weight on it. You don't want to just kind of put your two hands on it because that's not going to do much. You want to, um, essentially what you're doing is you're cutting off circulation by compressing the artery or vein. So you really want to get your full body weight on it to stop that bleeding. And one thing to note, don't ever stop um, applying direct pressure. So you don't want to just Oh, is it, did it stop bleeding? Because it will start again in any clot that has formed. Um, it could be washed away with the pressure of the bleeding from maybe the artery if it's an arterial bleed. So keep that pressure, don't let it go. Okay, so like we said, use any clean cloth. Um, although it is an emergency, if you can keep some kind of cleanliness and sanitation to prevent infection, that would be better than some and so we'll get into the second part of that later. And yeah, this is essentially just a repeat slide. So let's keep going. So let's go back to this diagram. Say there is a trauma kit. What are we going to do with that now that we have it? First, you want to find where the wound is. Hopefully, we did that in our Bs of ABCs of bleeding. Um, check if it's an arm or a leg. And also, if you want to check in that trauma kit, is a tourniquet available? Because a tourniquet will be able to uh, stop the bleeding most effectively. So say we do have a tourniquet. Awesome. I'm going to use it. What you want to do is apply it above the side of the bleeding. So you say you're bleeding in your chin. You want to put it below because that's not going to do much for it. But you do want to put the tourniquet above where the bleeding is. Okay, so the technical term of a tourniquet is something that stops the flow of blood, and that's essentially what we're trying to do in this class. And obviously, if um, you limit the blood that's lost, you can do a lot of good by preventing them, hopefully, from going into shock. And like we said, Applying a tourniquet and stopping the bleed on an end extremity is the most preventable um, way to stop a death. So, like we said, you don't want to apply a tourniquet in this general area, but it's very good for the limbs. You can put it on top of clothing; it doesn't have to be touching skin. But you do want to be careful that you, that the person doesn't have big bulky items or maybe a cell phone in their pocket because that can make the tourniquet ineffective. Another thing to note is don't put it on joints because your bones kind of protect 
the arteries and veins that go through your body. So if you put it on a joint, you're not going to be able to do much and it won't be effective. And don't put the uh, tourniquet on the lower limbs, kind of for the same reason. If you have two arms and, uh, sorry, two bones in your arm and two bones in your leg, and the arteries and veins run between those two bones. So if you were to put a tourniquet on the lower limbs, you're not going to be able to do much because those bones are protecting the flow of blood. So you have one bone here in your arms and one bone here in your legs. The arteries and veins run right along those. So if you tie the tourniquet kind of up high on these single bones, you'll do a good job um, stopping that. Okay, so there are a couple different types of tourniquets. The one that I personally was trained on and that I'm going to train you guys on is called the cat tourniquet. It looks something like this. You will, you will all be able to try them out later on. Although there are a couple different kinds. Um, so we have this other one here. It works essentially the same way, but um, it's just cheap. Yep. It works essentially the same way. It's called a soft tea, um, and it's just a different variety. So, like I said, I'll train you guys on the cat tourniquets, and this is the military's preferred tourniquet. It's easy to use, it's quick, it's fast, it does the job well. So, let's go over how to apply a tourniquet. Can I get a volunteer? Come on up, please. So let's follow these instructions so that we definitely get this right and we know how to apply this tourniquet. So we have our tourniquet. It's one essentially long band, and this is called the windlass right here. So let's see what we're going to do. So I'm going to pretend that your arm is bleeding. So like we said, we're going to put it up high. And what you want to do is put strap through this buckle here and we're going to put it around the arm. We don't want to put it down here but maybe a little bit higher so that we can stop the blood close uh, stop the blood flow closest to the source. Alright, pull the self-adhering band tight and securely fasten it back on itself. Be sure to remove all the slack. This is an important thing to note because if it's kind of loose see later, you're going to have to turn this windlass here and it's going to be just a lot more to turn. So uh, the most effective thing is to make this tight just like um, now when you're starting it out. So we're going to wrap it around and okay. Okay, adhere the band around the extremity. We did that. And do not adhere the band past the clip. Keep going like that just yet. Okay. So the breath looks like this. And what you want to do at this point is you want to twist the windless rod until until the breathing has stopped. Now one thing about trying kids is that they hurt a lot. Um, I'm not going to put you in pain right now, but what you essentially want to do when you are um, putting this on someone in an emergency situation is keep going. It's going to hurt and um, so what you want to do is you want to um, put it in the little clip right here like this. I don't know if you guys know how to take a radio pulse. We're, we, we will work on that in the practical portion but um, if I could just take your arm so before you put the tourniquet on, you should be able to feel a radial pulse right around here. After you apply this tourniquet at the end, you shouldn't be able to feel this radial pulse because that will let you know that you have cut off that circulation and you have stopped that bleeding. Okay, so once you have tied the windlass as tight as you can get it and you slid, slid it into this clip right here, you want to adhere the remaining self-adhering band over the rod through the windlass clip and continue around the extremity as far as it will go. So 
So you want to put it through this clip here and continue to wrap it around as far as it will go. And then what you want to do is this band right here, you want to tie this, or sorry, it's a Velcro, you want to put this on top so it kind of keeps it all together. So if I, if I don't do that, what could happen is that you've got all this, you can just easily let it go, the bleeding will continue. So that's a really important step to remember. Um, tourniquets hurt a lot, so the person who has this on them, they might try to fight you on it, they might try to pull it off. If you, um, if you don't put it in all nice and neatly packaged, they will try to rip it up because it hurts. So if you make sure it's all tied up and packaged nicely, and you put this right on top, I don't know why the lights went off. Um, but yeah, then they won't be able to take this turn and get off. Where's the switch? will be able to um, like know all the information hopefully that you give them and the time that the tourniquet went on is kind of important to them. Thank you so much. So there are a couple common mistakes with using a tourniquet. One of them is waiting too long to use it. Remember, you have <coughs> three minutes until you bleed out. That's really not a lot of time, especially in an emergency when you're all frazzled. you got to remember, tourniquet's got to go on. And like I said, tourniquets hurt. 
hurt. So a lot of people, they might feel bad for the person that they're putting it on and it might not be tight enough, but that's not going to be effective because the bleeding will continue. And don't forget, you can always use that second tourniquet. And never loosen any tourniquet, kind of like don't ever take it off. You don't want the bleeding to continue. All right, any questions? Well, I think we're going to take a little break from this lecturing and practice a little bit. Oh. Yeah, you too. Hi, folks. Uh, so um, we're going to pass the tourniquets out. Just so you know who I am, I'm Scott White, uh, emergency physician. I'm also a SWAT tactical physician. Uh, teach some of these advanced courses. Uh, this is all our, our gear that we're bringing here until all these fine folks get their equipment up and running. Uh, we've gone from 30 tourniquets down to, what did we say? We have 18. Yes, so. in a matter of uh, less than four months. So we do ask that they come back because they do cost us money. Uh, but so if everyone will pass one down along. Uh, so I think we got more students than tourniquets. I'll just hold on one. So I'm going to just kind of highlight a few things uh, that uh, Kristen was talking about. Finding the bleed uh, sounds pretty dumb, pretty easy. I'm going to give you an example. She wants to go, guy staggers into the ER, he's pasty white, uh, kind of crashes on the gurney. I'm in with another doc, we're trying to figure out what's wrong. Is the breathing is something else? We intubate him, we stop the breathing, um, strip him down. Lo and behold, there's a single gunshot wound, back of the leg. No blood, just went right in. Uh, put a tourniquet on him. Volume resuscitated him, blood, everything else. Uh, lo and behold, the bullet had gone in the back, traveled up here, and into the belly, bleeding out inside, but it had lacerated the femoral artery. She mentioned three minutes to bleed out from femoral artery cut. Doesn't sound like uh, very much time, and it's not, but it happens. All right? Um, March. Why is massive hemorrhage important? Most people in here know CPR, or at least heard of it, all right? Uh, so, what's the point in doing compressions if there's no blood in the system? Not much, right? Oh, thank you. All right. So, uh, stop the bleeding first. If you're not stopping the bleeding, forget about CPR because you're not going to circulate any blood to get oxygen to the brain. So, we're going to go over real quick um, tourniquet practical. Now, normally when it comes to you in your kit, uh, it looks like this all nice and plastic wrapped, all right? Now when it comes out of the kit, it's good to go, you can start to use it. These are practice tourniquets, so that means that your tourniquet may not be ready to go. So as you twist this windlass, it's basically pulling on this strap, all right? And if you see, that's what it'll end up looking like if you used it. So what I'd like you all to do is open up your tourniquets, get the buckle end, the red end, make sure your windlass is out of the clip, right here. All right, when all of you have got your tourniquets open, take the buckle end, take the red end, and snap it until it's all the slack is taken out. Good. So take it out of the buckle, it should be one straight line. All right, now, once you, once you reset it, the other thing you need to have you do is this thing will sometimes be across here and you won't be able to get your windlass in. So take it, if it's across the clip, and just put it on the same side that it starts from so that the clip is open in the middle here, okay? All right, now, when we're having guys set up their, or end gals set up their tourniquets on their equipment, their ballistic plates, whatever, officers out in the field, we tell them to get it ready to go on you because if, if I get shot and I go down, Kristen comes up to me, she should take my tourniquet and put it on me. If another one's needed, hopefully she'll grab hers and put it on me to try and save me, but always use whoever's tourniquet is on them first if they've got it. If you have yours, nothing else available, please use yours. So, what you're gonna do, take the, the red tab, put it up through the buckle. Now, what you wanna do is make a loop that is gonna be big enough to go over your largest extremity. So for me, my thigh, over my foot, 
Um, and if I'm carrying gear, so usually about that sort of size, because I got tiny legs, will um, fit around it. All right. So you don't want to start off with the tourniquet loop being that big, right? That's not going to fit too many people. So get the loop to a, a size you think would fit over your thigh, basically. All right. Put the Velcro on it just like that. Now, what you would be doing is put the clip in there, and you're going to fold it, and it would be right somewhere we can grab it. So let's say you're shot in your dominant arm, right? And I, I'm carrying my tourniquet in my right arm, I'm in my right pocket. It's going to be awfully hard for me to reach across with my left arm. So I'm just giving you a little bit extra on this. You don't need to know this as much, but ideally you want it someplace you can reach it in the front or back in the center of your stuff. But what you're going to do is you're going to take your tourniquet, you're going to put the tourniquet over your arm. Now, one minor point, you see the red? That's what we're going to be pulling on. So if you're putting it on yourself, you want to slip it over the extremity so that the red is pointing towards the center of your body. Because what I'm going to do next is I'm going to grab this red and I'm going to pull it as tight as I can towards me. It's and easier it, to pull towards you than try to push against you. Yeah. Now I'm going to wrap it as it can almost hurt when I'm putting it on, taking the slack out. You should be able to start to control the bleeding just by pulling it tight. Okay? Now, once I've gotten it sort of up near the clip here, I'm going to take the windlass, and it shouldn't take more than one, maybe two turns. All right? And the stop points are essentially the bleeding stops and or you can't feel a pulse in your extremity. Okay? So now once you've gotten it tight enough where that's not happening, I can tell that's true here, take the strap and slip it into the clip. All right, can everyone see how it's in the clip? So I just slipped it underneath the, the clips there. Everyone able to see? Anyone need a little help? Let me check it. All right. Next, take the, the white or gray piece and pull it across the clip. It's now secured. Now, if you happen to have a nice black sharp marky, uh, nice black mark, whatever, sharpie, you know what I'm talking about. Write the time mark. Let's say you have no pen. What you will have is plenty of blood. All right? Dip your finger something in the blood, put a nice T on the forehead. So, what color is the tourniquet? Black, right? What color is my shirt? Black. When someone comes in to me in the ER, how hard do you think it is for me to manage everything all at once? I may miss this because black pants, black tourniquet. But if I see a T, I know, hmm, there's a tourniquet somewhere. I've got to dress that tourniquet and the wound associated with it. I'm going to loosen this up because it's starting to kill me. All right. But what I want you to do, each of you to uh, do it on yourself. All right. And then do it on the partner next to you. Now remember, I'm taking this off. Is this good to go? No, you've got to reset it. So undo the windlass. All right, you see it's kind of slack. Take it, reset it. Just like that. Through the buckle. And should be just long enough to make a loop to go over your, your leg. So if you didn't get to use one, please grab one and use it. Anyone else need one? I can give you my demonstration one now. I got one more now. I'm not demonstrating. You good? Oh, you know. Thank you. Ready? Thank you. Anyone else want to check in? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, uh, so actually, what you do is from the first one. It's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
seconds to get it on, you're one-third of the way to bleed out. Not much, um, right? All right, so everyone ready? I'm going to call out an extremity. Okay, left leg, go. I'm going to tell you the left leg. You want to take a Okay, yeah, no, no, I'll make a note. Five seconds. So you want to go to another one? You've already been so You got it on, get your hand up, have someone check. See if they can get their fingers under it. If they can, 15 seconds. Have someone check you uh, yeah, get your fingers under there. 20 seconds. Check your partner. Check next to you. Get your fingers under. It's no good. 30 seconds. 35. Have someone check. Can they get their fingers under there? 40 seconds. Have someone check. Can anyone get their fingers under there? 45 seconds. One minute, you're one third of the way of bleeding out. Anyone didn't get it yet? 
Alright, and exercise. So let's get the tourniquets on, get them reset. Okay? Get them reset. Who didn't go yet? Did anyone not go? Alright, now we're at a nice country concert somewhere. And uh, you happen to be in the crowd listening with all your friends. And lo and behold, you're not injured, but your buddy next to you is. So please pick a partner. Okay, you've got 30 seconds to get it on the left arm. Go! One of you is the victim, one of you is the traitor. 10 seconds. Fifteen seconds. When you're good, get a hand up, have your buddy check it. Twenty-five seconds. Thirty seconds. Thirty-five seconds. Forty seconds. Forty-five. Anyone not done yet? Fifty seconds. Fifty-five seconds. Exercise, exercise. All right, so you were a victim, you are now a traitor. So get your tourniquets reset. So during some of our more advanced classes, we show a video. There's a British troop out on patrol in Afghanistan, and there's a uh, infantryman who actually had took an IED and uh, lost a leg from the knee down. And uh, the medic happens to have on his body a body cam, and it's recording what he's doing the entire time. And he puts the tourniquet first thing on the leg and cranks the heck out of it, gets the bleeding under control. Um, he goes on to look for other injuries as we train. And what the medic does not realize is he's leaning over the injured infantryman that's just lost his leg, and you can see the infantry guy's hand come down and loosen the tourniquet. What does that tell you? How bad would it be to get your leg blown off? Pretty damn bad, right? What does that tell you about a tourniquet? <laughs> Hurts like hell, all right? And that's the drive home point that this is gonna really, you know, not be your best day, but I'm gonna save your life. It's gonna hurt, don't loosen it. They're gonna be screaming, take it off, I can't stand it, I can't stand it, I can't stand it, get it off. It's gonna be okay, you're not gonna bleed to death. All right, so it's not a subtle point about it's painful. And that video highlights that. And we're not showing it here, but it does happen. So if you were the victim before, you're now the treater. Everyone ready? You are, let's see, you're walking along and all of a sudden a lawnmower blade comes off from a facility and gets your left leg. Go, left leg. <laughs> Five seconds. Ten seconds. Good. Check your neighbor. If the hands up, check your neighbor. Twenty-five seconds. Thirty seconds. Check your neighbor. It's good. To that did not get it on within a minute. Good, all right. Applaud yourself. Good work. All right, so let's go back to this diagram here. We went through all that, and then is there a tourniquet available? Okay, so 
now we know how to use a tourniquet. What are we going to do if there's not a tourniquet? Now that we know how important they are. So, if you don't have a tourniquet, you can use any kind of dressing, um, whether it's hemostatic or simple plain cloth, and apply directly to the pressure. And this is also good for your neck, shoulder, and groin, like we said, because you can't put a tourniquet around anywhere here. So, something to keep in mind is that, yeah, I'll just show you. Um, so, this stuff is called Quick Clot. This is a trainer version. Um, this stuff has, um, this stuff has stuff to help the bleeding con uh, work even better. So, there's a bleeding cascade. It's the positive feedback loop. I don't know if you guys have taken anatomy and physiology, but if you do, you will learn about that. And the materials in here essentially heighten that and enhance it so that you stop bleeding even quicker. But I mean, not everyone carries this around, so you can use regular simple <laughs> gauze or any kind of cloth. So here we have the quick plot, although you can use other versions of it, like Celox, Celox Rapid, and Cheetah Flex. So what you want to do to pack a wound is, first of all, obviously, is expose the area. You can't put pressure, or you can't pack a wound if clothing is over it. And also to help you out, you can remove any blood that's right around the area so you can see it a little clearer. And our ABCs of bleeding, locate the source of the most active bleeding. So what you can do is you can stuff this right into the wound or directly on top. We do recommend um, putting it inside the wound because that will uh, essentially stop the bleed a little bit better. And it does come out in one pack, there wasn't any in there, and we'll go over how to use this in a minute. So essentially the reason why wound packing is better than direct pressure is because it will um, add a little bit more pressure to the inside of the wound. So if you apply direct pressure right on top, you can see it superficially maybe stops it, but blood does pool up on the inside. Whereas if you pack the wound right, uh, pack the wound with gauze right inside, no blood will pool and you'll do a more effective job stopping the wound. And one thing I do want to say about that other diagram, if you could just go back for a second. So if you do get shot and you have a gunshot wound, what happens is called cavitation. So there's one little tiny entrance hole, but once it goes inside the body, it will tend to spread and do more damage inside and it will essentially create a cavity of injured area. So that's why you really want to put it inside because um, in a gunshot wound especially, you can put it right on top, but there's just so much more destroyed tissue and bleeding area underneath that you really need to make sure you Pack the wound rather than apply direct pressure. So, like we said, uh, put the gauze on and hold pressure. And you can apply a second pack if you need it, but always do as much pressure as you can. Don't let that pressure go. Okay, any questions about wound packing? What if you cut off the tip of your finger? that stuff for that too? You can. This will. This does have that clotting enhancement capability, so you will be able to clot that better. Um, I don't know if the ER doctor wants to add anything to that. So, do you want to do the back and hold now as well? Uh, yeah, do you want oh, to answer uh, your question sure. first? Sure. Uh, so, combat gauze, uh, quick clotting, um, is one of the supplement types of gauze. This is impregnated with something called kaolin. Anyone heard of kale pectate? All right, well, I guess I'm dating myself. It's uh, something you used to use. I have. Yeah, an older old person. Um, every now and then we'll have adults in this. Uh, uh, but kale, uh, kale pectate and kaolin, it's clay, all right? And I like to give uh, tidbit histories uh, interesting. Kaolin is actually English uh, bastardization of the town Kaling in China, where there's a mine that they mine this stuff from. And the miners found that sprinkling the clay on would clot the blood. Uh, 
KON basically is a um, ionic. It's got a I always got to that. It's got a positive charge, or no, no, yeah, positive charge. Your platelets have a negative charge, and plus and minus. They like to stick together, so the platelets like to stick to this, so that you enhance everything coming in for the rest of the coagulation pathway, and you start to fold a clot or form a clot. The other ones, Celox, um, Cheetah Sand, have a shrimp shell derivative. It's very far removed from uh, the shrimp product itself. There's never been a reported case of someone having an anaphylactic reaction from shellfish allergy. So whatever you can get your hands on, whether it's uh, combat gauze or uh, cheetah sand or one of those, it, they work effectively. The main thing is getting it in, getting it on, holding pressure, just like we said, three minutes, same thing for uh, pressure dressing, if you don't have a combat gauze or something else, is holding pressure. The other thing is, we encourage you to hold it for a minimum of three minutes, which is about how long it takes to form a clot. If you can hold it for an hour, great, but uh, you know, three minutes is the bare bones minimum if you can't hold it uh, longer than that. Yeah. So we're going to go into the details of how to pack a little right here. So we're going to have you guys try on these mannequin legs. This one keeps rolling on me. <laughs> yeah, here. So this quick plot stuff, it will come pre-packaged in kind of a Z fold so that it's easy to use and easy to get out. This one is not. It was we reuse these. <laughs> um, that's, that's okay. So um, what you want to do with this is this is going to be what you're going to pack with. Um, you don't want to get this on the floor maybe where um, it's more prone to infection and picking up dirt so what you can do is actually just stuff this down your shirt make sure your shirt's tucked in so it didn't come out the bottom mm -hmm. but um, this will keep it essentially a little cleaner than the ground and hopefully you'll be able to prevent some kind of infection so what you want to do is create what's called a power ball so you want to get like a tiny little ball of gauze make sure it's packed very tightly and very thick because um, this is going to be what's going to be at the bottom where you um, are first putting that pressure on inside of it. So we're going to pretend this is a gunshot wound. Someone got shot on their leg, okay? So you're going to take your power ball and you're going to put it right inside the wound. Remember this is a cavitation wound so even though it's a little tiny hole that is your entrance wound, there's a lot more injured area inside. So you want to, if possible, find the source, find that artery, you'll be able to feel the pressure, you'll be able to feel that pulsing, and you want to push your power, power ball right down on top of that because you're trying to get to the source. And what you want to do is never let go of that pressure. So even when you're packing a wound, you want to keep your thumb on it and then get that little bit with your next hand that you have available. and then. Put that down, but don't ever let go of pressure. So the pressure that you're holding with this thumb stays on until you can immediately switch fingers with your other thumb. And you want to keep going with all the gauze that you have. You're going to take the next little bit with that first hand and switch real fast. But don't let go of that pressure. And you're going to keep doing this until, um, this is not working because it's not folded correctly, but okay. So you want to just pack until you have no more to pack, but if maybe it's a small wound or something, you want to just put all of that on top. So like I said, biggest thing, don't let go of that pressure. I'm not going to go and do this whole thing right now, but I wanted to show you guys the details because I want to see all of you guys do this on this same mannequin right here. Just one other point, this squiggly little line is not just there for looks, it's actually radio opaque. So when it's stuffed into the wound and they come to the ER, we take an x-ray, we can see, oh, there's some combat gauze in there. This will show up on that x-ray. So what we have here are some fake uh, legs here or arms. So you take some of these and pass them down your row there. And we're also going to give you some gauze to practice with. All of this has to come back to us. Uh, please. Uh, the gauze, if it's rolled up, 
um, it should be folded uh, into like an accordion, all right? This is not correct how it rolls like that. You want to fold it back and forth on itself like that. <laughs> All right, the other thing is, uh, so these are training packages. This is the real deal. What's the difference? The color of the package. The other thing, please, we're going to open up our training gloves, which you are. These are closed with Ziplocs. So we can reuse them, all right? So you just take it at the Ziploc end and just open it up. This does not have any Ziploc, but you see it's got some perforations or little bees. So I'm getting ready to use this. Just rip that V and it comes right out. Should, it's the same exact stuff otherwise. Alright? So, uh, the gauze is coming around. If you don't get one, let us know. Um, the Powerball that Kristen talked about. My uh, business partner is actually uh, Green Beret Special Forces and he actually taught me that. Uh, and it's used in the SOCOM community, so uh, you're learning something from the Special Forces group. So basically, get your fake leg, usually tell people to put it between their, their legs. Uh, if it's folded correctly, I actually like leaving it in the, the packet itself. I can put it in my pocket, down my shirt, here. If you have to, you can leave it on the ground, but it's going to be much better if it's here because you've got close control of staying clean. Let's say something bad starts to happen. Ooh, I can now grab the person and move with them, and I can continue to pack, okay? So what we want you to do is to get that power ball. All right, get it all nice and tight. Should be about an inch in diameter. And then get it down the bottom wound, and each time you're grabbing a new section of gauze, it's about three or four inches that you're grabbing and stuffing down into the wound, all right? So go ahead and practice on your foam legs. Yes, I'll practice. Now, when you're done with it, the only thing you do ask, as you saw, we, we've got a bunch of rolled up gauze. Uh, if you could take it and uh, flatten it out, and then you'll see there's little fold lines on it. You don't have to fo follow the fold lines, but just do us a favor and just refold it so that the next class doesn't have a rolled up ball of gauze in. All right? The ball just needs big enough to get inside the wound and something to push on. So like that's your thing. So um you just want to do is keep pressure with your fingers. And then on the other side you want to take while you're holding pressure like the artery. And apply a little bit and then you want to do yeah, you push more in and just switch it right when your finger touches. I usually find that two fingers first, but you can use your thumb. As long as you're taking that right. Yeah, but see how you switch hands like that? You don't want to do that. You're going to put it on top. Yeah, because otherwise you're letting go. It's a little second, but still not to make it just kind of fall away. Those well, cash out on your foam things. Uh, we realize the hole goes all the way through, so you don't have to try and fill the entire foam. The idea is just to get the idea going into that hole. There you go. Yeah, I did that one. Let me see how you do that. Okay. So what you did real quick is almost right, so you had it there, so put it right on top, and then you will just pack it so you can't have any more of the no, the better you can You don't have to put quite as much in each um, switch, maybe like that much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
So for your practical, when you come up front, you will need to use the same gauze, so hold on to the gauze, uh, so you will want to fold it up properly for your practical, okay? Yeah, that works. The biggest thing which you're doing all right is just keep the pressure on is it fast enough? Well, I mean, like, going to your fingers. I wonder what I'm reading. Just want to make sure that there's always pressure on the pictures. So when you're switching fingers, instead of going like that, put one thumb down, uh, one thumb down right on top, and then let go. Because that way you will make sure not to lose pressure. So if it's like and you can use your longer fingers that uh, strength rather than just your arm. Thank you. shut up after all this is done here. But so what we're going to ask you to do is to have your, your tourniquet, which you will have reset to make sure that the windlass is back to its original position. The, the tape is, or the, there we go, the clip tape is off the side. There I'm reset. All right, now, I've stumbled upon someone who has whatever type of injury that requires bleeding. Now, we're telling you to put pressure on the wound as soon as you can, correct? It's one of the ways to stop bleeding. What happens if I come up to this wound and I go down and I put both my hands here and I'm holding pressure? Can I get my tourniquet out? Can I get my gauze out? All right, can I use any other part of my body here and maybe help me? How about a knee? Yeah. Or how about a foot? Whatever you got, all right? So what we'd like to see you do when you're, you're coming up to your practical, all right? You've got your tourniquet, you've got your gauze, Get a knee right on that wound, all right? You can get a lot of pressure on that real quick. That's your full body weight, whereas maybe you won't get as much with just your arms. Yeah. Get your tourniquet on the, the, what we call the proximal, or the, the closer part of the extremity. Get your tourniquet slack out, get the windlass cranked up, get your power ball ready, your gauze all good to go. Now get here, and then start packing the wound. Then get onto the wound and hold pressure. Okay, so that's what you're going to be doing for your practical. Uh, and as an example, when you're done with your practical or waiting, we have what's called a biofeedback unit here. You'll be able to get pressure and see just how much pressure it takes and how how difficult it is to do. Right, I'll show you. No, that's okay. Do, you, do you guys have any questions before I move on? Okay, just a couple side notes while you're packing that up. You can um, 
use tourniquets on kids, maybe not babies because it's just too small and the tourniquets are too big for their little limbs, but instead you can use direct pressure and wound packing on any kid of any age and any size. Okay, and one last thing to wrap up <coughs> is that bloodborne pathogens are a real thing. You do need to be worried about them. Um, so if you do have gloves before this whole thing, put them on. If not, make sure you wash your hands, be sick, um, care, take, make sure you're taking care of yourself. And you can notify EMS or your doctor if you think you got exposed. One thing about HIV is that it, as long as your skin is intact, as long as you don't have any cuts on your hands, your likelihood of contracting it is very low. So. I understand the worry, but you don't have to freak out over it because you're probably going to be okay. Although you can uh, notify anyone just in case. And so just one quick wrap up of the course. The A, B, C is bleeding. A, alert, call 911. B, bleeding, find the bleeding injury. C, compress with either tourniquet, direct pressure, or wound packing. And one last little sentence to keep in mind. The only thing more tragic than a death is a death that could have been prevented. Thank you guys for coming to the course. Before you guys get your certificates, I do want to see you guys use the tourniquet, wound packing, and direct pressure. And then you'll get your certificates and you'll be good to go. Any last questions? <laughs>